This is Christy. Happy Thursday, everyone. We've got some people signing on. Hope everyone's having a great day. Just going to give it a few more minutes before we uh, start our little session today. Okay. All right. Well, while people sign on, I figured uh, we might as well get started. Thank you all for coming today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christy, and uh, I'm the marketing director here at Mirabelle Technologies. And uh, I wanted to do this webinar because um, I have a background in advertising and publishing, and I've also helped grow companies. And I thought I could help steer and provide some guidance for publishers who are getting into this new trend of creative services. I've worked at the New York Times in their in-house marketing and creative services department, which is actually a lot like being at an agency. It's their in-house agency in essence. And I've also have about 10 years experience working on media planning and communication strategy work at some pretty big shops. I've worked at Gray Initiative. I've also worked at Horizon. And I've also um, worked at OMD, which is now OMG. And I worked at Publicis, and those two merged actually uh, fairly recently. I've also worked on some pretty big brands, including Frito Lay and uh, uh, Clairol, which is a PG brand, IHOP, the History Channel, David's Bridal, a lot of other ones too. And I've helped uh, work at, I've helped uh, grow some emerging companies. And um, this is important because I understand what it's like to have limited resources when you're trying to grow uh, a new venture. And um, I've learned how to really stretch bud budgets, especially tech budgets. So um, I can probably help you there and actually, my colleague and wonderful teammate, Nathan, is also an expert on this, too. Hey, everybody. My name is Nathan Smosky, and I am the Senior Account Executive for the Marketing Manager Division over here at Mirabelle Technologies. Um, as Christy alluded to, I have a background of working with some tech and software industry and uh, spent my entire career in that side of things. And while Christy can help you out with understanding some of the uh, nuances of procedures and operations for uh, you as you take on this new role, um, I'm going to try to help come in and help out with giving you an idea of the resources and technology that might be available for you that can help you out with this. So uh, thanks everybody for showing up and uh, Christy's going to go ahead and get this thing started and I'll talk to you soon. All right, cool. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat them in the window. If we don't get to them right away, we'll get to them after the webinar. And if we still don't get to them in the webinar, we'll definitely get back to you. So um, yeah, so we're here for that. Okay, so why did we have this webinar? Well, we can't miss this big fat trend in publishing. It's all over the papers. Um, publishers and agencies are overlapping quite a bit. And I think it makes a lot of sense because publishers have a lot of writing talent in house, graphic talent, and they understand how to engage audiences. So if you're feeling like your ad dollars are diverting to Google and Facebook, one thing you can do as a new revenue stream is build the content that they use to fuel it and, you know, be part of that cut. So it's a trend that makes sense. And I think that publishers will be very successful with it. So just to give you an outline of what we're going to be covering, um, I'm just going to cover a brief history of creative services billing practices and how they've changed. Because if you are starting to offer these kinds of services, um, the billing can be a little complicated. So I'll be talking about that for a bit. I'm also going to give you an idea of average rates for some of the big shops and smaller shops out there. I'm also going to cover uh, why agencies use creative briefs and how they can help you. And I'll show you an example of one as well. We're also going to talk about metric goals in your brief. And then Nathan will be showing you how clients who love seeing marketing ROI, how you can do that with specific tools and uh, how to do this affordably. And I'll also talk to you about how to stretch your tech budget 
when you're doing all these new capabilities and what other resources are out there to make you an expert in this area. So when we talk about creative marketing services, what are we talking about? Well, we're basically addressing uh, needs beyond just the ad space. You may have clients who buy print ads from you, but they don't have their creative developed on hand or they have creative and it's not very good. Um, really anything that leverages the talents of your in-house writers and designers uh, would basically fall under creative marketing services. You can sell this as a service, um, really using your own sales team. It's, uh, so for example, if you were selling a client a custom advertorial, instead of them providing you what to say, you can offer and sell them the opportunity to have your staff write it and your staff design it. And the same goes for native content and a lot of other things you might be working on with a client, whether it's a web page, um, brochures, white papers, coupons, whatever it is. So that being said, I think that publishers are actually equipped to start doing this right now. Um, you'll still have your sales reps selling ad space, but it's just the other side of ad space, the content that goes in the ad space. And you have the same writers in house, they'll write for your publication, but they'll also write to uh, engaging content about that will promote your client's business. Then your designer, same thing, they'll design for you. And then they'll also design and help your clients. And your project manager and production manager, there's not going to be a whole lot of change there and your billing manager, pretty much the same job. They can basically bill you for uh, your clients for ad space and they can bill the same clients for creative services and they can even do it from the same CRM system. So if you're using magazine manager or newspaper manager, you can do all that too. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so one thing that could get tricky is that uh, you know, a lot of publishers have agencies as their clients, and I can see how that could possibly create a sticky relationship. But here's the thing. One shop doing everything nowadays is very rare, um, and partnerships can be very critical for success. So even if you can write for every medium out there, whether it's blogs, white papers, TV, radio spots, advertorials, or collateral, you probably won't handle every aspect. So for example, if you write a content piece for a client, you might actually be working with an SEO firm who's buying or SEM firm who's doing some more of the search optimization for it. Um, you might end up partnering with another agency on app design. So I think that there's enough work out there in the world of digital media, especially that there's probably not going to be a whole lot of overlap. And I think if you um, recommend certain clients to one of these partners, then they'll return the favor. And I think there are some opportunities to really work together there. So billing has changed a lot for uh, creative marketing services. When I started, um, things were very different. And really, the point of this is that there's no right billing model when you start providing these kinds of projects for clients. If your client is happy and you're profitable, that's the right billing model. But back in the day when I first started in advertising, um, I worked on a client where they had um, media planning and buying and creative all in the same house. I was actually, my first job was working as an assistant media planner on Olive Garden. And I think like our percent of gross was like 3% gross for uh, television and that would cover uh, staff costs. Sometimes we, they were only dabbling, I think, in interactive. I think it was like 11% because the cost was so low to buy it. But anyway, this doesn't really exist anymore. And here's why it made sense then. I mean, some people might do this, but the reality is, is that Media used to be the biggest advertising and marketing expense for these clients, you know, if they're buying national television, for example. So if you do a percent of gross, it made a lot of sense. Same with buying national print. So when the scope of work used to just be TV, radio, print, direct mail, and out of home, this was just a really common type of thing. 
now that we have so many partners, you don't really see this very much. Now you have these newer disciplines out there, such as inbound content marketing and social media and app, de app design that are well outside of the scope. And media commissions are now usually a hybrid uh, with retainers, flat fees, and hourly rates. So uh, you might be getting some commission on, on media, but now it, there's all these other things that go into it. So for example, you could do a project based on time and, and materials, and that's very common. But you want to just be sure, make sure that you're accurate with uh, hourly allocations and not go above hours by 20% or whatever number you think your client would be unhappy with. And then if you have, if you end up doing a flat fee, um, you want to make sure that you're covered for how much time it takes. When you do time and material models, um, a lot of times you'll see a blend in rate because what you pay a senior designer versus a junior designer, that's probably going to be different. But if everybody works on a plan, uh, you might just have one rate that's an average, and then you can use that when you cost out a plan for a client. The other thing that people do, we talked a little bit about flat rates. Um, there's also monthly fees. So you might have a client that pays you monthly to do a certain scope of work. And then if you go above a certain number of hours, you can charge them on top of that. You know, just again, to talk about flat rate projects, let's say you're building a website for X number of dollars. Uh, flat rates are really great for clients that approve everything and never ask you for a revision, but sometimes it's better to do more of a time and materials for these larger projects. The other model that I've seen out there, which is newer and I haven't worked with personally, is percent revenue. And that's more common for e-commerce. So if you're in the shopping cart, I guess your agency partner might take a little slice of that and that could work for some people. But at the end of the day, however you bill these people, a good publishing CRM will handle any of these types of scenarios. Now, hourly rates uh, can vary quite a bit, and that's because market conditions will dictate that, your overhead will dictate that. So obviously to cover your rent costs in New York City and San Francisco, these shops charge an awful lot of money. Now, some positions can be outsourced, but others are harder to find overseas. Maybe you can find a developer who's pretty cheap overseas, but you know, when it comes to copywriters, you're probably better off using your own writers to do some of these projects. Now, theoretically, if you were to try and get some of these types of creative assignments, you might wanna charge a little less than what um, big agencies charge. But at the end of the day, what really matters is if you're good, because as you can tell from this chart, clients will pay high rates if you're good. And, you know, I think that's more important. So, yes, you want to be affordable, but good is more important. OK, so here is an, um, an estimate that I did real project for a uh, website redesign. And this is just kind of showing one way you can cost out an assignment for somebody. Now you'll see things like billable hours or non-billable hours because uh, when you work with a client at the beginning, gathering the site requirements, maybe you don't have the project yet. So you want to show them how much work you put into it to some extent, but not necessarily put that in the estimate. But then you can pad your hours in other areas on here. Um, and this will just give a client an idea of what kind of work goes on when you do a big project, because sometimes in their head, this is really easy to do. And then you can show them what exactly goes into an assignment and then they'll, you know, be a little bit more amenable to paying the bill. So hopefully that is, is somewhat helpful. Um, okay. Agency retainers. Um, I had to include this tweet from Adweek because, uh, I follow them. I think they're quite funny. A D W E A K, not the regular Adweek. Um, <laughs> because let's be honest, uh, agency retainers, especially for big shops can be huge. Um, and usually a retainer doesn't 
come from doing absolutely nothing for, for somebody. Um, a retainer could be, for example, this is somebody's retainer that I just used as an example, four email templates a month with includes design and landing pages. Also two blogs a week, some daily social media posts, but I'm not sure how many social media networks they were doing, and then monthly reporting. So um, for smaller shops, you're going to be looking at a smaller um, figure in there. And again, it just, it really depends. So one thing that I've done a lot of is write briefs and work with briefs. There are creative briefs, there are media briefs, there are marketing briefs, there's lots of different kinds of briefs, but they basically have the same purpose. They're designed to save headaches and, uh, you know, also your project, your profit margin, because <laughs> if you're, especially if you're doing a pl uh, flat rate, you want to make sure that everyone's on board with what you're doing. So a brief will define your core objectives, your strategies, your goals, your metrics, and uh, it also minimizes revisions and bad ideas. I'm sorry, but there are bad ideas out there, okay? <laughs> Good people have bad ideas. Bad ideas meaning off strategy, um, not worth it, not really accomplishing what you want. And a brief will kind of, in a very kind and polite way, say, no, we actually shouldn't do that. It's not really outlined in the brief. They're called briefs because they're one to, one to two pages, but they also could include attachments such as a Gantt chart, wireframes, maybe strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, then threats type of uh, competitive map and analysis. They might also have a content matrix if you're doing a website. And essentially anyone can fill it out, but at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that everyone agrees with it. So here's an example of a brief that I did uh, just for today, just to kind of help you picture it. Uh, I picked uh, Joe Schmo Donuts, <laughs> opening a shop in any town USA. So what they do is they tell you your business challenge up front. They'll give you an idea of the category landscape. So for this one, we're talking about Joe Schmo uses low fat ingredients and that the, these donuts are a little pricier than some of the other chain restaurants selling donuts out there, but Joe Schmo treats don't come with guilt. And so here you cover a lot of your marketing basics, competitive insights, what your position is, and then you'll usually have a business objective. Um, in this case, we wanted to generate, I didn't know how much to put in for revenue because I didn't know <laughs> what donut shops expect on a daily basis. But if your client gives you that, it's kind of nice to put it in here. And then your marketing objective, generate awareness, strategy. Okay, I want to inspire trial, get people to start trying these donuts and showing up at the store. So we're going to do a dollars off coupon and a print ad, and we're going to do a blog article on the health benefits of donuts. And then we're going to do a dedicated email to um, a sophisticated foodie list as a, that a publishing company has because they always have lists of all these engaged people and whatnot. So um, we talk about the role of communications to trigger cravings. Now, your brief does not have to look exactly like this, but these are things that you just think that are important before you start doing any design work. I also threw in here reason to believe the right to win, very common to see in agency briefs. Um, you know, what is it about it that makes it special and unique? And here I wrote, our donuts are like crack, but they don't make you fat. And then single most important thing, which steers the creative direction, um, Joe Schmo Donuts satisfies dangerous cravings. Now, here's another thing you want to put in your brief, success metrics. How do you know if this is working? Okay, we're going to look at email clicks and opens, number of pe times people download coupons, and how many coupons get redeemed as just a way to measure whether or not this worked. And then uh, any requirements that your client wants to give you, you have to use this color, you have to use this logo. You always want to make sure you cover your bases in there. Briefs don't have to, again, briefs don't have to all look alike. They can be much simpler than this, but a good brief will mean that your client knows what's to expect and that the people who are working on it know what to do. And other things I see in these briefs, sometimes they have like 
brand personalities. Sometimes you can get fancy with your target audience and get into these whole segment personas. You can talk about your primary target versus secondary target. Um, you know, there's other things you can add in here that you think might be helpful. But what makes a good brief? Well, that's a good question. For one, you want to be a little careful with your projections because clients will say, hey, if I spend this much money with your publishing business and you do the creative, what's it going to get me? Okay, um, fair question and it's understandable. Um, any of you who are sales reps, I'm sure can relate to um, clients screaming about ROI. Well, here's the thing. Um, Big agencies have tried to do this. I remember working on TV optimizers, and they get this wrong. You can dump in a whole bunch of money into an optimizer and spit it out at the end and, you know, say it will show you how much product will be moved by X amount of dollars dumped into prime time or whatever. And, it, you know, it's not very accurate. And because the problem is, is that your creative could be worn out. You could get a PR crisis um, you can have a competitor show up and there's market conditions that are out of your control. So what I would recommend is actually showing historic metrics. If you have a client who's bought a lot of media from you in the past, maybe showing, OK, when we did this last year, what did this do for your business? And show, try to show some sort of a metric snapshot of what that does. Um, the other thing, too, to keep in mind with a brief is that, you know, you want to focus on what moves product. Um, effective marketing isn't always good. And I think that TV is proof of this. Um, the reason you see terrible ads on TV is that they did some ASI testing and people asked at the end, oh, what products do you remember? Would you consider buying this? Does this sound like something you want? And when people say that they remembered a brand and they said that they thought about buying it, it passes testing and then it gets on the air. So uh, that's kind of <laughs> so, of course, you don't want to create anything that's terrible. But, you know, if it's effective, it's effective. It's good marketing. Um, and then, of course, a brief, if it's good, it will include attainable metrics and success and success metrics that you should expect. So everyone is familiar, I'm sure, with a funnel, of course. Um, but when you pick metrics, it has to make sense for the customer journey. Um, B2B and B2C marketing funnels can look a little different, but some of the same marketing principles are the same. So at the top, you really are all about generating awareness, um, wanting people to explore and engage with your product. Um, that's where a lot of your web traffic gets built. It's where your followings on social media happens. And then as you move down it, you know, maybe people will start uh, downloading white papers or attending webinars, or maybe they'll sign up for your email list of some sort. So those are more in the middle. And then your action oriented purchases are at the end. Well, here's the truth about these kinds of funnels and metrics. Every client's going to be like, let's say you have a real estate client. It said, okay, I want X number of new clients selling their house from this campaign you're doing. Well, that's great, and it's an understandable goal. But the thing is, if you have uh, about five people who've ever been on your website and have zero social media followers, maybe the metric goals you want to come up with will be building that traffic, building an email subscription list, and building you know, a little bit more awareness uh, um, in different channels as opposed to only focusing on the final, final conversion. So, um, and that's just something that I've encountered with clients before where they want to focus solely on the end. And, you know, and I think you might encounter that too. So analytics are very important. And my colleague, Nathan, actually, can talk to you about how you can manage them. So I'm going to say over to you, Nathan. All right, thanks, Christy. Um, yeah, so that was a really informative uh, set of information from Christy to uh, help us with some of the procedures that you're gonna go through when you're making the shift over. And uh, you know, a lot of the things she touched on I think are very important, and especially the setting expectations and also delivering some uh, metrics that are actually going to be measurable for the for the client. So, 
you want to set the expectations for the client and then you want to back up to show that they actually got their money's worth. So how do we do this? Of course, we're going to use analytics. So there are a lot of resources out there. Um, you can use your, of course, your uh, Google Analytics, which is the most basic. Everybody should be using that. You can use some information from web campaigns or from email engagement campaigns, the Facebook or any type of social media engagement that comes after that. But the thing about it is you're, you're probably going to produce some campaigns that go across different platforms. You're going to see them across different channels. And taking all this different information in so many different places and putting it together into one package that's easily presentable and also easily digestible so you can see where you're succeeding and where you're not, that doesn't come easy. And it doesn't come cheap most of the time. Usually, if you're going to do a package of a tech software that's going to be able to give you that kind of centralized reporting, you're looking at at least $1,000 a month. For most of the bigger names, you're looking at, even for a smaller company, probably about $30,000 a year. So it's not an uh, insignificant uh, investment. However, there are other options. Okay, So there are uh, options to use a software stack using several different uh, uh, t technologies to bring the reporting into one uh, easily digestible format that you can present to your clients in a much more cost-effective manner. Um, so the, the number of options are pretty much endless. Um, for our case, for what we do when we are using this type of uh, um, uh, information to provide to clients or to look at our own uh, results, we use the central uh, reporting uh, tool that we use is our own technology, the marketing manager. And we integrate off of a few different resources. Some of the ones that we've found that are some of the more affordable and sometimes free options such as Unbounce for creating landing pages, MailChimp for doing your email campaigns. MailChimp starts off free and if you start scaling it up, it then becomes uh, a, a paid thing, but you have a an option to try it out for free and do it on a limited scope. And if you like what you see, then you can move it up to getting a, a, a paid version that allows you to have more uh, more options in a larger database. On top of that, of course, go to webinar. That's what we're using right now. And then uh, Zapier, is a, it's kind of the, uh, uh, the skeleton key of uh, tools that's going to allow you to kind of plug into all the different tools out there so you can make some changes as the, uh, as the market changes and go with some of the futuristic things like chatbots and predictive analytics and things like that. When looking at your tools, there are some things you would really, really do want to consider. You want something that's going to be flexible so that you can separate out each individual client's metrics and you can also give them a uh, an access point if they so desire some clients want to be hands-on some of them want to actually see every single report and know what is happening where's the engagement how what kind of ROI are we seeing off this what kind of uh, increase are we seeing where you know where's your proof of your actual activities others are kind of hands-off and they want to see okay show me what we're at where we're at when this is all over with so you want that flexibility you're gonna to want to definitely find something that can do both um, they might want to run their own email marketing accounts or their own social media accounts and might just want you to produce some of the aesthetics or some of the actual copy for it, or they might want to just hand it off completely to you. And when it comes to actually getting these leads, do they want something that's in real time delivering directly to them that they can go in and look at, or do they want it to be handed off in something that just um, you give them a report on a weekly or daily basis? It's it's really up to up to what you want to deliver to them and really what the client wants, of course, as well. Now you can always resell some of those tools that you work with and some of the reports, mark them up a little bit and offer them to other people. And you also have the option to have something that integrates with your own systems as well. Now, the great thing about what we can offer or what you can get from some of the other tools that are out there is it kind of takes a lot of the guesswork out of calculating the ROI from a marketing campaign. In the past, people would go ahead and they would do a particular campaign and then they would see, okay, is there a spike after this or is what's the result in, uh, in, in leads coming in and conversions and actual sales and then let's reverse engineer it and assign it back to this particular campaign and say, hey, we spent X amount on this and we got this back, so here's our ROI. Kind of an exact science and kind of an extrapolation. Nowadays, we can actually show you 
uh, how many of your campaigns have actually touched every individual on every channel and show you a way to reverse back with definitive intelligence on how they actually interacted with these campaigns and assigning ROI on a basis of on a scientific method instead of an extrapolation or a guess. So the other thing about this is it gives you the ability to do some A-B testing so you can make better decisions. So you can try out a, a campaign on a limited scale for a little while and see exactly what's happening and then uh, try another campaign and then choose the one that works the best to scale it up. And you can do that with definitive information if you have the proper tool set, as opposed to kind of guessing and getting into that kind of nebulous situation where you decide, uh, maybe this, maybe it went with this, but maybe it just happened because of something else. Or if you have multiple campaigns, not knowing how to assign, you can actually use tools now to specifically identify each one. And this is a uh, this is a new world that we're all going to be entering here, and it is it's it's definitely going to be big for publishers, but it's going to be big for everybody because as we all know nowadays, people go out and they use the internet as almost the exclusive way of finding information. So, SEO is going to be important. Digital marketing is going to be ever more and more important, and there is a ton of content out there. There's a ton of people giving you advice. Some of it's free, some of it's affordable, some of it's not so affordable. But here we have a list of some of our free and affordable resources for not only tools, but also for information. Almost every site you go to will give you some, uh, some information on exactly what you can do to maximize your digital marketing or increase your SEO presence. And just uh, try to do the best you can with your digital presence to maximize your return for yourself and for your clients, of course. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll no. see, yeah, we should see also if we have any questions, by the way. Uh, not too many yet, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of summarize everything and bring it all back together, um, we have these points coming across, you know. So there's no standard billing model, but, you know, that's kind of the name of the game, right? It depends on the work you do and the work with your client. And it, it extends more to billing because, as we mentioned, everything's customized. You know, if the if the client was looking for something that was going to be a one size fits all, then they can go out to uh, buy some sort of a set of software, or they can buy some uh, pre-made uh, templates and things like that. They're coming to you for a customized option that meets their needs, so the billing needs to be customized as well. Quality is always going to be more important than price in the end game. If somebody spends X amount of dollars and gets no results, but they spent a X plus why and got some great results and it ended up being more hey they're always going to go with option b they'd rather have some results than something just spending money at less money and getting nothing out of it it's about the roi now the clear creative brief it's very important in every relationship to set your expectations and to meet them that way nobody's going into this with some sort of belief that something's going to happen that nobody has any intention of having and along the same lines, you need to report metrics. You need to show them that you're being effective, but you also need to manage the uh, expectations and don't overpromise and underdeliver. Go with the opposite. That's always going to work out better for you in the long run. Along the same lines, you know, pulling in all those metrics, getting all those analytics. You know, if you're using a bunch of different tools that are disparate and don't talk to each other, that can be another chore. It can be a little bit difficult. And if you get multiple uh, different clients, that starts to become a job in and of itself. Luckily, we have a tool that can help with that and can help with many other regards as you go through this process, but ourselves and others are available, but uh, you know, you want to try out the marketing manager, give it a look. We're always available for that. Uh, Nathan, we, I have a really good question, actually, I was just asked. Yeah. Um, so they were saying that they noticed that we're focusing a lot on digital marketing, you know, which is huge. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. print media is also still very heavy and still very huge. How do you Absolutely. recommend ROI reports for clients using this medium? Which is a great question because it's a difficult one. What yeah, I it is. For something like that, okay, is, well, it depends on the kind of ad and what you're advertising. That actually may not, may be the one time, if let's say you're designing a brochure or designing a print ad, that may be the one time your client doesn't harass you for ROI because they're used to that print is a slower build. Um, but if it's some sort of a direct call to action in there, like a phone number or a website, you might have to do a specialized web page. You can calculate how many people um, go to a specific web page or 
how many people, or if you use a unique email address as contact in there, you can always do that as something that you can measure. But yes, print media is still very, very tricky to, um, to prove. And hopefully if you have a smart client who understands the value of print, it won't be a huge, huge issue. So, but it's a fair question. Yeah, yeah, I think Chrissy perfectly nailed it. Uh, I mean, there are ways you can integrate that. So use a print uh, format to drive people to a unique digital presence so that you can track ROI off that and provide some analytics that way. Um, But print's not, you know, let's let's not pretend like print is going away. I mean, uh, the print print has been around for quite a while, and I think it'll persist to be around for quite a while because people like tangible forms and also you know, anything that's not non-digital media is still going to be here as well. So it, while there's always going to be a little bit of an art and a little bit of a science with assigning ROI and analytics as we go forward, it, we we want to be able to give you as much science as we possibly can. So um, I think Christy nailed some of the good points, and I just want to uh, make sure we reinforce it with that. Okay, we have also another question. Okay. Um, newspapers deal with very small businesses. Is there a way to measure customer size and amount of dollars they ought to be able to spend? Oh, that's such a good question. Wow. Um, you know, I guess what I would do, and it depends on the market that you're in. Um, I would say on the page where we had some of the lower agency rates of $50 an hour type of thing, um, you know, for a small business, I would say creating fewer assets. And if you create assets for them to try and use them, if it's a classic type of an ad that has a lot of legs, um, that should be good. Um, for small, I don't know what the right number is, though, for a number of dollars that they ought to spend. I think that for me, I think that will become a time and material thing. So if they're already buying ad space with you guys and then they need to get creative on top of that, um, you know, maybe just billing them time and materials and hourly rate, however long it takes to get the, the ad done. And that might be one way to, um, one way to approach it. Um, yeah, I would agree. Um, I think that it's very important that, you know, it has to work for everybody involved when you're doing this, because, it, it, you know, as Chris kind of touched on that, it's, this is a partnership and that, you know, it is customized. Everything needs to be customized. So you need to find a model that works not only for you, but also for your clients. And if you have clients with a limited budget, then, you know, maybe you spend a little less time on them or you provide a little fewer resources. It's just the reality of the situation. The good thing is that a lot of these uh, digital resources that you can offer with somebody as far as the analytics side that we were speaking about it's not really dependent on traffic a lot of the times. So, and even if it is, it's very incremental increase. So that doesn't cost, doesn't add much of an, of an extra cost when you take on more projects like that. Mm-hmm. So definitely factor in your time. And um, I think that would definitely be with your, when you're dealing with small budget clients, time is the thing that you need time to make, uh, yep. be most cognizant of. Yep. I also have another really good question. Um, Any thoughts on how we should bill a client for creative when it comes to an ad? Not talking graphic design. I'm speaking about the true agency level creative to give them, you know, give them a chance to actually win in the market versus what the client would tell us to put in an ad, which rarely works. Yes, I know. (laughs) There are bad ideas out there, agreed, but we get blamed for it. What is the going rate for creative services and concepting from headlines to slogans to pictures. Oh, okay, great question. I'm going to go back to a slide because, all right. People who are good at this stuff get paid a lot of money. Um, your creative director, you know, um, they could be getting in big markets like 300 an hour. So basically what I would recommend doing this situation, is I would maybe have a contain like a, retainer for whatever it is if you're rebranding them and you're doing their logo doing their headline and have it as part of a retainer and then do hourly on top of it and maybe it involves doing some ideation sessions where you do competitive mapping i remember at omd we had something called checkmate where we used to go through these drills of like um really doing a deep dive into um what resonates with these target customers. I think we did like some focus groups, but yeah, I think what you're talking about here though 
is when you're starting to go into that real true agency level work, I think that's going to end up being more of like a retainer plus hourly because people like that who are really good at those things, they're not cheap. So, um, yeah. So I hope that helped answer that question a little bit. Um, all right. So see if we have any other questions. Oh, somebody asked me also if I can share a template of uh, the brief. Um, yes, I can definitely do that. Um, I have, like I said, the brief can really be whatever you want, but, oh, by the way, if you're doing really grinding into those like deep creative projects, um, I'll put some other things in there that you might want to have in there, such as brand personality and a lot of other stuff. So we'll be following up with an email maybe tomorrow or early next week, just with the exported video. So you can refer back to it. I'll include a uh, creative brief for you to um, work with and feel free to change for whatever purposes. And Nathan, of course, is obviously here for any questions. Um, so I think are good, unless anyone has other questions. I figured, you know, your time is precious. So I don't want to keep you all on too long. Um, but thank you all so much for attending today. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Oh, I should probably, Nathan, I should probably put your information on the screen. Voila, here we go. And you can keep in touch with us as well on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll be sending out a video soon. Uh, have a good Bye. one.